it is a little after four o'clock and with any luck this will be posted on Facebook shortly after um, we're done with the live part of it <clears throat> so um, I hope you all see what I see right here if anybody doesn't see on the screen what I'm talking about please type in and let me know but right now you should see the welcome screen that says Neograft and so Neograft as you may already know, is the name for a minimally invasive hair transplant procedure. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. All right, so let's go through. Um, so just a couple quick facts about uh, hair loss in the United States. And as you probably already know, it's pretty common. And we defined approximately 35 million men and 21 million women as having hair loss in the United States. Um, and so, as the statistic shows there, pretty much 40% um, of men and 60% of women, believe it or not, it's a higher percentage, um, will experience some hair thinning and loss by age 60. So no big surprise there. And so we're going to here to talk about some options, not just transplantation, but that's of course the, the main part of what we're going to talk about. And I'll just keep checking as we go along here to make sure uh, any questions that come in get answered. Um, so just again, a couple more statistics. We'll leave the boring stuff in the beginning while people are just joining in. Um, most popular age range is 30 to 50, but um, I have patients as young as their early 20s and as old as their 80s, believe it or not. Uh, so definitely a broad appeal. And as you might have seen there, almost 100% increase in hair transplantations in the uh, last 15 years. And most interestingly, the, the percentage jumps 31% uh, in female um, patients. So all this just aims to tell you that it's gaining in popularity. I think one of the reasons why it's gaining in popularity is it's such an effective, amazing natural procedure with long lasting results. Frankly, I'm surprised it hasn't grown faster, but I think that the reason why is because people in their head have a, a preconceived notion of what hair transplant is, which is really what hair transplant was 30 years ago, which was not good. Um, and the state of the art is just, it's just near perfect. So um, I see some new people joined in there. So hello, and uh, definitely send me a, um, a hello in the comments so I can recognize you by name. It always feels more personal. I'm used to having these seminars in person. And since COVID, you know, we're doing them, um, you know, online. So I feel a little bit uh, more disconnected. Tell you a little bit more about the science here because uh, I really am fascinated with hair. What you're looking at here is under a microscope, essentially, it's one square centimeter of a normal scalp. And what you're going to see here, um, what you're going to see here are, are groups of hair follicles. So in this one, in this one follicle, we have three. Um, shafts coming out, we have three, we have two, we have one, but we have large groupings, what we consider to be large groupings. This would be pretty thick hair. This is normal hair in a person with a normal uh, amount of hair on their scalp. And if we go here, you're going to see in contrast much thinner groupings, right? So we see fewer groupings farther apart with smaller hair follicles. Again, that's dense and that is rather thin hair. And so as we lose hair, we lose hair by the hair follicles first producing fewer and thinner hair shafts, which we consider to be miniaturization, until eventually the hair follicle finally ceases to grow a hair shaft. Men typically will follow um, the Norwood or the Hamilton scale, and if we, we look down here, it's a pretty typical pattern where we have a mature hairline where the temples recess a little bit, and then as it progresses, the temples will recess more, and sometimes people will lose their frontal forelock. Um, but that will continue to progress until we see some of the, the top of the head, the vertex. Um, and then eventually when we get down to what's considered a, a, a Hamilton or a Norwood 7, which is just this little band of hair in the back. Women typically lose hair a little differently according to the Ludwig scale. Um, most commonly it starts with a widened part and then that part gets wider and sometimes they will lose the entire crown but their frontal hairline is preserved most typically. However, some women do follow a more typical male pattern where they lose their frontotemporal region. Um, it's all devastating for everybody, men or women. So I'm just kind of pointing out some patterns to understand how we approach things. The principle of hair transplantation is very simple. The hair in the back of the head here that I'm pointing out, right here, you know, the part 
back here. So that, that horseshoe of hair, genetically it's not predestined to be lost through age or hormones, right? That hair, even the people who have the thinnest of hair, that hair remains. And it's not a question of the area of the scalp, it's the follicles, meaning we can take the hair from back here and transplant it to the front where we need it, and it will remain and continue to grow and not be susceptible to that age and genetic related loss. So I, I like to use farming analogies because it's pretty simple. It's, you know, it's not the field, it's the crop. So we're going to take the good crops from the back and bring them to the front. Most everybody is a candidate unless you have such advanced hair loss, especially in men, that there just isn't enough donor hair to cover meaningfully uh, the hair that we want to cover. And so we consider those unfortunate people to be what we say donor site limited. Um, but fortunately, it's not a lot of people. That's, that's the minority of, of patients that we see. And there are things we can do to slow down hair loss um, prior to the point where we get to that donor site limitation. So that's kind of the, the history, the background on hair loss, okay? So why neograft? So here are all the advantages of neograft that have made it such a popular procedure. It's an awake procedure we do in the office. There's no permanent scar in the back that's visible. Um, the, the results are incredibly natural. The take rate's in the high 90s and the recovery is quick. So this sounds pretty much good to, to everybody considering what the alternatives have been in the past. Um, what this is replacing is what's known as the strip method or FUT, follicular unit transfer, where we would have to cut a big section of the scalp out and then uh, under uh, microscopic guidance, cut those follicles into smaller individual follicles or follicular units that we would then transplant. This surgery required anesthesia. It was longer, it was much painful, much more painful. Um, and unfortunately, even in the best of hands, has this resultant scar that's visible when your hair is cut very short. So people don't love that. There are a few indications uh, for which the strip method is still beneficial. People who are really donor site limited, um, you can get a little bit more in the way of harvest and you're actually kind of shrinking the scalp a little more. So there are some indications, but they are fewer and fewer and not really what we're talking about today because um, you know the limitations are significant with, with that method in terms of the scarring and the pain and the recovery and the cost and all that. Contrasted with the right picture here with Neograft, what you're seeing is somebody the next day and then a few days later where you can see that the hair is growing in and um, there's really no noticeable scar there. And so the advantages, as the screen says there, we're only harvesting the follicles we need and there's a very high take rate, okay? So we're gonna talk a little bit more about what all that means. All right, um, what else can you do? Yes, we do eyebrows. Um, not that often, but if people have lost their eyebrows, you absolutely can transplant um, head hair, get it angulated the correct way. Of course, you'll have to keep trimming it. Um, you can do other areas of the body too, chest and beard and things like that. I don't, I usually stick to the head. Um, you can redefine a hairline, you can add volume and thickness, and of course, earlier is better than later. So, you know, prevention is always better than cure, right? And last but not least, this is, this is called FUE. So if you've heard FUE, follicular unit extraction, that's what this is all about. So again, awake, no anesthesia, minimal downtime, very, very safe. Let me show you what it looks like when we're actually removing a follicle. So what we're looking at here is the back of somebody's scalp. And this is the neograft hand piece. So you're looking at a shaft, a rotating circular, essentially a core. It's a, um, it's a rotating sharp punch. And we match the size of the punch up to the size of the follicle. So people who have large follicles will have larger uh, punches and people who have smaller and smaller, but we just match it to the correct size. And then you'll see there's vacuum tubing and each follicle as it gets removed, gets sucked up into the tubing, into a collection chamber, and we move on. The idea is that we are only taking a small percentage of hair from a given area. And then the holes around, uh, the area around the hole will shrink together. So it's not that that area is now devoid of a hair and you lose that percentage of hair in the back of your head, but rather the hair around it will get closer to one another. So your decrease in density is insignificant, essentially. We only take a certain percentage of hair each time. Um, 
we can go back and harvest that area again, but we don't want to over harvest the first time we are doing it, if that makes sense. Um, everybody still with me? Is everybody um, following along? If you have any questions, please jump in. We're going to, the fun part is coming. That's coming up right now. Before we get to the fun part, let me just talk a little bit more about some other options that are clinically relevant, okay? And so I recommend a lot of these for my patients. So um, there are really five. There's going to be Propecia, Rogaine, Laser Therapy, Supplements, and PRP. Finasteride Propecia, um, as you might have heard of, is typically used for men, and it is a medication that blocks the conversion of testosterone to DHT or dihydroxytestosterone. DHT is typically what is the offensive agent in androgenetic hair loss, mostly for men, but sometimes for women. And so by blocking some of the conversion of that in the bloodstream, it prevents hair loss in approximately 85% of men, greatly slows down the process. This is really important because as we age, our hair loss, once we get past our 40s and 50s, greatly slows down. It's not linear. It really starts to peak up into our 20s and then into our 30s and 40s and 50s, it will decline. So if we can keep as much hair as we can throughout those years of life, um, we are sort of winning the war without losing that hair, you know, so there's less of a need to transplant. Rogaine is, in my opinion, less effective. Uh, it's a topical medication. There is a male and female version, although the only difference is percentage strength. The indications are for the top of the head, the vertex, but that's just because that's how the FDA indication was written with the testing that was done, but you can use it anywhere, and I encourage my patients to use it everywhere. Um, I think the hardest part about Rogaine is that it's not a wow wonder drug, and it's difficult to remember to put stuff on your scalp every night, and it can be a little bit irritating for some people. But otherwise, there are minimal side effects, and um, you have nothing to lose with it, right? So before I had my transplant, I was always doing this area. And, um, you know, I, I, it definitely helped keep some of the hair, but I don't think it made a huge difference. Supplements and shampoos, I think, have a role, especially some shampoos that have DHT blocking agents in them. And then there are some, some, some supplements like Nutrafol, um, which people report great success with. However, none of it's been tested through the FDA, so I don't have large studies with, you know, big sample sizes to really go over. It's more anecdotal, uh, but again, nothing really to lose with it. Finally, low-level laser therapy. I recommend the laser cap. Absolutely, that works. We know low-level laser light therapy works to increase cellular energy for any cell it hits, but especially rapidly dividing cells like hair follicles or like uh, newly healing scars. So we use this in our office after some of our laser procedures for the face, after microneedling, after surgery, and especially um, after, during, and around hair transplant uh, to increase the immediate take and the decrease the inflammation to speed the healing process. However, in regards to the laser cap, uh, I forgot to bring mine today, but essentially it looks like a cap that you'd put on your head and it's covered with low level laser diodes and that's gonna increase the cellular energy. So typically you start with three times a week for a few months and then you go down to two times a week, a half an hour each for approximately, uh, or approximately half an hour for twice a week. Um, indefinitely and you know it's a really easy thing to do I put it on when I'm watching TV for half an hour twice a week and um, I've had patients and myself I mean it, we've only been using it for six months to a year but I can tell you my hair looks thicker my wife's hair looks thicker and this is the only real intervention that we've been doing so I, I'm a huge believer in that you can get that through the office so we, we'll talk more about that in the future if you'd like and then finally PRP which stands for platelet rich plasma and again, this is another one of those sort of wonder therapies like the low-level laser therapy, which stimulates follicle growth, but this time by injecting growth factors directly into the hair follicles. And those growth factors are taken from the blood, and then we spin it through a centrifuge, separate out the platelets, and then activate the platelets to release their alpha granules, which have all of the growth factors in them. And so, of course, this is this could be used as a monotherapy, meaning if somebody's just thinning, they come in and get this done. I've seen amazing results, especially with younger people. Uh, I think they still have a lot of follicles that have miniaturized but aren't dead, and so I think it helps bring it back to life. Um, but also people of all age have seen improvement and maintenance of hair. So PRP could be a monotherapy, but I use it in uh, accord with every hair transplant because what I see is two things. One, the hair follicles that are newly transplanted, a lot of them will continue to grow. Whereas before we had added this in, 
um, the hair follicles would live, but the hair shafts would get ejected, and so you have to wait three or so months until you saw that hair starting to grow in, and it could temporarily look worse before it got better because of a phenomenon called shock loss, where the very act of putting the hair follicles in can cause some of the hair follicles around them to temporarily eject their hair follicles. PRP and red light has seemed to stabilize that, and people tend to just look better and better and better, which is really encouraging after you've had a big procedure done. Um, these are what we call alphabet soup. It's just a list of all the growth factors that are in PRP, and I'm not going to bore you with it, but just know that there are some that are um, very specific to hair growth and um, wound healing in general. So when it comes to the day of the procedure, so what we do is we design a hairline. You'll come into the office, it's done in my office, and you'll meet the team that day. And the team always consists of either myself or my wife, the other Dr. Cappuccino. And so it's always overseen by an MD, and we're going to make sure the process goes safely and effectively. I'm going to do things like get all your medications drawn up, help with blocks. Um, I'll actually do some harvesting to make sure I like how the follicles are coming out. I may help with site creation, kind of have our hands involved in every part of the procedure. But the rest of the team is going to do a lot of the work as well. So our lead technician, Dr. Hernandez, has been at this for, God, over 20 years now. Uh, probably transplanted more hair follicles than anybody I, that I know. He's absolutely amazing. So he's our lead tech, so he's going to do a lot of the harvesting um, and help us with site creation and insertion. But as a team, including the patient, we are going to design a hairline. So um, this, this gentleman was actually a tech that we worked with. And like many men, you'll see he was sort of thinning in the temples um, and in, in the top of the hair as well. And so we're going to design a very natural, mature hairline. And you can see the, the black marker here comes up, um, but still maintains a little bit of a widow's peak because that, that looks natural. So that's how we'll design a male hairline. Female, hair, female hairlines are typically straighter across. They don't tend to have that temporal recession, um, although there's a regularity to it. And we always build in a regularity. Even though it's a straight line with a pen, when we're actually creating sites and implanting grafts, it is highly irregular. So it's what we would call regularly irregular. And that's how we make it look natural. And if you see, this is what the patient will look up, look like pre-op. This is a male patient. We typically will shave the back of male heads. Females we do a little differently. Um, but we see the hair before. We see it at day one after we've removed some hair follicles. It just looks red. If you look close up, you'll still see some of the little tiny holes. And then by day five, most people are sort of back to social activities, back to work, and they look completely concealable. So before I get into my procedure and kind of walk you through the procedure itself, does anybody have any questions at all, comments? I'll even take a, hey, it's a really sunny day out there today. Um, you're doing a great job, Dr. C. Uh, talk faster, whatever, talk slower. Just um, say hi to me, feel lonely. All right, so here we go. This is the day of my procedure. So. Uh, my wife Rachel was my doctor that day, Doug was my tech, and they worked together to get my transplant done. But it was really something that's bothered me for a long time. My temples had sort of um, retracted a little bit and my hair was thinning and um, I had noticed it, but I kind of ignored it. And then we had rented a convertible on a trip out west and my wife took a picture of me because I was very proud and felt very cool to be in this car. And when I looked at the picture, I couldn't believe that I could see part of my scalp up here. I just, I just couldn't believe it. Um, yeah, it was really one of those strange moments in life where you're like, wow, that's me. Um, and so I, I have an immediate sense of empathy for people who have hair loss. And when the opportunity arose and we started doing the neograft procedure, I couldn't wait to get, get my own procedure done. So um, what we're doing here is we're measuring. And then what you're going to see here are some of the marks. So it's not dramatic. On the right side of my head, all I did was lower the temporal recess a little bit. I brought down the frontal hairline a few millimeters and stabilized it. It was getting a little thin and I wanted to just make sure that it didn't go back any farther. But uh, on the left side, you could see my hairline was really recessing back. And so this may not look like a lot, but uh, that's you know about an inch uh, at its greatest depth there. And that doesn't include the grafts um, in the back. So that's, uh, that's my marking. And then what you're gonna see here uh, and this is all done with local anesthesia, so I didn't feel anything. My scalp was numb. What we've done is we've created all the little holes. This is literally done with a needle. That's how small these holes are, just a needle that you would draw blood with. And what we do is we sometimes, 
Hey, thanks, Shelly. Yeah, and you know what? I didn't even mess with my hair much today. Um, she said I have a good hair day. I, it just happens to look good. Thank you. And thank you for letting me know that somebody is here and, and is interested in what I'm saying. Um, so at any rate, we sometimes make the sites first. Like if we're not sure how many graphs we're going to need, we'll make the sites first. For some people that have a large area to be covered, we harvest first because we're limited by how many we can get out of the area. And then we just put them wherever they're best suited. But in my case, we had a finite number of graphs that we needed and I wasn't donor site limited, so we made those graphs first. The key here to making a hairline look natural is really about the angulation of the hair follicles. So, um, you know, it may not be apparent unless you think about it, but in the front of our scalp, hair shafts come straight out like that. And then as we turn toward the side, they will start to fold back until we hit sort of the side of the scalp where they will then fold down and back like that, right? And so, and at the top of the head, there's a swirl pattern. And it's critically important, even to the position of the bevel of the needle, how you make those recipient sites. And that's part of what makes this look so natural because it is natural, it's your own hair, it's just back where it belongs. All right, so that's the remainder of my um, recipient site creation. You can see that there. And then now what I'm gonna show you is a little video, hopefully it will play on here, of what it actually looks like when the graphs are being harvested. Oh, rats. Well. See if I can open it. You know, this always happens, right? When you open it with a different player. Hold on. It just takes a minute to open, but this player will work and it'll show you the harvest procedure. All right, here we go. There we go. So you're seeing the individual follicles being extracted. And that's about the rate that it happens. All right. So once all the harvest is done, the grafts, the follicles are um, transplanted into a Petri dish. At this point, we would bathe it with platelet-rich plasma and get those grafts ready for implantation. Also, we separate out the singles, we call them singles, but the ones that have the very thin single hair shafts because we want those right in the very front of the hairline and that's how you get a natural transition so it looks uh, the most natural. And then after that, it's just a question of sitting down, relaxing, and uh, you see Doug here with his loops on, he's gonna start to put some of those grafts in. And it's just a painstaking process, it just takes a while. Um, it's a lot of work for us, but it's an easy process for the patients and you know we, we make a very nice day of it. As you can see here, um, I am watching Raiders of the Lost Ark in this picture here. Uh, just got my feet up, relaxing. Some people will bring ear pods and listen to music. Some people, will put, we put music on in the room. Uh, but the point is, it's really not a bad day. In fact, it's quite relaxing. We make sure that you have lunch. We'll feed you lunch. We'll make sure you have water and bathroom breaks and um, we just try to make it easy. When we're all done, we'll wrap you up with a little piece of gauze like this, just to hold a bandage in the back of the head. And what you're looking at here in my scalp are the follicles after they've been transplanted. And so it doesn't look grotesque, it doesn't look bloody, they just are stuck in place. And uh, we're waiting for these follicles to heal. So now what happens is we give you some post-op instructions, which are very simple. All you have to do, we give you a spray bottle of saline, is just spray the area and keep it clean. But you're not gonna wash your hair or get your head wet for two days. You can wash your body and shower, but you just don't want to wash your hair. Now, in terms of what my donor site looked like, this is what it looked like the next day. I don't typically unwrap people the next day, so you'll never see your scalp like this, but I wanted you to see what it looks like, just so you know that it doesn't look horrendous, I'm not bleeding, I'm not in any pain. And then two days later, pretty much all the way healed in. And at this point, we just faded my hair so that it matched up and there wasn't a hard line, and I looked pretty normal, and I was, I was back to work at this point. Um, you can wear a hat immediately, believe it or not, because the hat's not going to sit on the grafts. 
Chris, I had 1,400 graphs, which is a fair number. Um, but remember, I only had, uh, let's say, maybe 1,200 in the front, and then I had a few hundred in the top of my head, uh, which, as you can see, is, well, I hope you can see, is pretty solid. Um, here are some of my pictures from about 10 months out, and it may not look all that dramatic to you, but especially in the mirror, to me, I noticed a big improvement. I was sweeping my hair forward all the time, and now I can just sweep it however I want. Um, but again, this was more about my own personal um, desire to improve my hairline. It wasn't massively noticeable. I just didn't like how it was looking, and I wanted to deal with a easier way to manage my hairstyling. Um, and there it is up front. What I'm really showing you here is just how natural it looks. You can't tell when somebody's had a neograph done because it looks perfectly natural. Um, hi, Leslie. Okay, with men, you're trimming the donor site hair short. Yes, correct. How do you handle it with females who have longer hair, like shoulder length hair? Love results for the PRP that you did a few years back, and now I need to fill in more at the crown. Yeah, okay, great question, and thanks for, thanks for asking that question. So, yes, of course we have a way to manage uh, women. So, um, with women who have even just shoulder length hair, but basically anything but really short hair, what we do is this. So, here's the hair. What we're gonna do is flip the hair up, like that, shave a very small section right in there. We typically say it's about the size of a credit card, right there. And then we flap the hair back down. So again, lift the hair up, shave a small credit card size section, and drop the hair back down. So no matter what, we prioritize concealment of the donor site. And then you just have to wait for that to grow back in. Um, for women who are really donor site limited, meaning we just can't get enough wraps in one procedure, what we'll often do is just go back three months later and reharvest that same area. So you're not dealing with uh, you know, concealment problems at, at any point. So um, hope that answers your question. Great question. Thanks for asking that one. That one comes up a lot. This works for all ethnicities, all types of hair. Uh, this is four days after African-American hair. Um, here's some straights. Um, sort of Asian hair in a woman who had some temporal loss, um, sort of just like that wavy hair, really curly hair. So it works for any kind, even works for white and gray hair. Um, African American hair again, black hair. So, okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to go through, I'm going to show you some pretty, pretty fun results from my patients recently. This is where it gets fun because I get to kind of brag a little bit and show some great results. Um, okay, so first one, you can see a gentleman here just with um, the very typical temporal hair loss. And this is after one treatment. So completely corrected, very natural hairline. Here he is from the top down. Um, he was keeping his hair very short. I guess he didn't like how it looked when it was longer and thinning. And now um, looks pretty great. So love that one. Female hair loss, so frontal hairline. This one uh, is an atypical one. Remember I said usually the part widens. This young lady, her hair had just recessed all the way back. You can see some of the follicles right there. And so the goal here was just to bring it back down to that point. Now, this is only nine months later. And I say only nine months because uh, it really continues to improve. Like the hair is still growing in there. And it will take really uh, 12 to 18 months to be completely healed in and look, look its best. Um, Cheryl, yes, will it be safe to continue color? Yeah, so I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, the book answer is you should wait about three months after um, transplant, although for most of my patients, I tell them a little sooner than that, like by two months, and I've even done six weeks. Once the hair is all growing and stable, um, then it's like any other hair, right? I mean, your scalp is healed. It's just another hair shaft that's coming out. So three months at the very longest, two months is, is more typical. Um, here's the typical widened part, and this can be tricky because it depends on where you part your hair. So it's easy when there's just one small area that's lost hair, but it's harder when it's the whole scalp. Uh, but you know, this, this is sort of a, a good example. Let me show you one of my absolute favorite, favorite results. All right, this gentleman, one of my favorite, favorite people. Um, so he 
was uh, into his 70s and he had been a, a hair uh, stylist his whole life and so um, obviously it was very important for him to have um, a nice hairline and I was really really honored that he came to see me and um, he had two transplants he had one he looked great after one I'm going to show you what that looked like and then he had a second one um, to just get a little more thickness and I'm going to show you his progress as we go through here so this is his first treatment so here he is before and then at one month starting to get some peach fuzz six months we have a nice hairline and at eight months it's getting thicker and thicker and from the top down view same thing so you know we have sort of that horseshoe pattern starting to grow in starting to grow and then really coming in at six months is sort of the magic uh, time for people when they see that coming in and a younger person here same sort of thing temporal loss thinning in the front nice wavy hair beautiful hair and just not enough of it and so there we have that and front um, this gentleman same sort of pattern I'm going to show you what it looks like at four months you can see the hair starting to grow um, and you're gonna see a big difference when we get to nine months so here comes nine months and you can see it's thicker and darker um, and there's just more of it another friend of mine he's a, a colleague of mine um, who has you know darker skin but lighter hair and uh, we're just really starting to, to get thin and so this is 10 months after so his hair is getting nice and long and thick and the, the back of the vertex is starting to come in nicely as well um, another gentleman who just again transformed his his look um, he liked his hair longer and so it really got tricky when he was losing that hair up top he had a big area to fill so we actually did this gentleman over two procedures the first procedure we just focused on the front and the top but not the back and so this was just after the first procedure to get um, coverage of a nice hairline and then if you look here this is our before this is our interim so from the front what I was just showing you before where his hair had grown in the front but we didn't have enough to do the back and then we came back this is a picture he sent me today actually because he's on vacation and he keeps missing his appointments for um, follow-up so this isn't the best picture on the right but you get the idea um, that his hair is starting to grow in and if you look at a, um, a side view now you can see that his hair is covering the entirety of his scalp so there he is before in the intervening stage the intermittent stage and then um, finally show you some more female hairlines this is a good friend of ours and she had just really started to thin up top and this is the more typical uh, where the top of the head just starts to thin so um, this is two years after 1600 grafts and I'm going to show you a bunch of different angles and she's now very happy and confident to wear her hair down again or where she had have to wear it up before um, there she is and she's beautiful and her hairline just looks so lovely and um, makes me so happy that, that she's confident to wear her hair down again. And there's a three-quarter view, looking at the scalp from the three-quarter view, and from the side view, and from the side view. And again, it's just very, very natural results. Um, we had a young lady who had lost her frontal hairline, which happens. Sometimes, you know, it can come back, and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, and so you can see her hairline, it might not be very apparent to you, but it was to her that this part just had come up and we wanted to bring that back down and give her a natural hairline. And so um, what you're looking at here is the day of the procedure, right after the procedure, and then nine or 12 months later, whatever that picture is there. And uh, you were asking me about what the donor site area looked like uh, before Leslie. So I'm gonna show you what that looks like. So um, this is the back of her head. And what we did is we flipped up her hair, and as you can see, she just has like a credit card size patch that we harvested from. I hope that makes sense now that you can see that. We flipped that hair back down and that would be covered. Uh, a lot of men just have concerns with uh, thinning in the top and the back of their head, and if that's the area, then no problem. Um, as I was discussing angulation of hair shafts, you can see there's a swirl pattern. There's a sort of clockwise swirl here. 
and we just followed that and we just added hairs in all the way around that swirl pattern to get that thicker and of course the back the donor site area you know you can't really tell a difference you're not going to see a scar it's not you know noticeable that we've done anything and that's sort of the magic of that here we just top down and we went all the way out to the front in his case um, so yeah he probably could use more he was very thin here but this is a good candidate for PRP and Propecia will also help to thicken the existing hair. So it's sort of a multimodal approach. Um, and that kind of brings us to the, the end here. Um, I think there's just a couple more uh, things worth talking about, like maybe pre and post procedures. Um, Pre-op stuff is just basically like any other minor procedure, right? You know, you, you absolutely can't smoke. I mean, it's just not, it's really gonna kill the follicular take. In terms of prescriptions, we get you scripts for an antibiotic just for that day, an anti-inflammatory medication, uh, and also some pain medication, but mostly people don't take it. They just take Motrin. Um, I do give people Valium the morning of the procedure. It's not because people are nervous per se, but your heart can feel a little jumpy with all the epinephrine that we use during the surgery. So it just helps to kind of calm things down. And then it's a nice, normal day. You have breakfast, um, and we get going. Um, I do ask people to get a short haircut if they're men. I like it to be buzzed down really to a one or a zero. Women don't have to do anything because we're going to take care of that for them. And then afterwards, uh, this we've modified over the years. So yeah, it's probably not a great idea to have um, alcohol, but I really don't have problems with ibuprofen right after surgery. We just have not had a problem with bleeding, so you can use that for pain medication. I actually didn't use anything afterwards. I had almost no pain. Part of the reason is I use a long-acting local anesthetic, which is very expensive. But well worth it and uh, there's no expense too great for my patients honestly I want you to have the best results and you know share the experience with other people so there's a medication called Exparel it's used for nerve blocks and it lasts like two days and so I inject that in all the areas that we're going to be working so that your scalp's pretty numb really for, for about two days by the time that wears off there there's no pain um, again afterwards there's gonna be a dressing on the back of the head for a couple of days that we will remove when you come back two days later and you can just clean your hair with a spray bottle, but that's it. After two days, you're gonna wash your hair, but we'll show you how. Uh, warm, warm, soapy water, but we're not gonna let a strong stream of shower yet hit it for about uh, two more weeks. Uh, and then that's pretty much that's pretty much it. Propecia shouldn't be stopped. Rogaine, we ask people to wait a month. Um, and nothing on the scalp, otherwise, like um, any other hair products or color dye, things like that. And in summary, uh, what are the things that would prevent it? Well, if you had an allergy to lidocaine, if you had high blood pressure that wasn't controlled, and a blood thinner you couldn't go off of, and if you're a smoker, but that's not most people. So let's see, last last slide, this is sort of a neograph slide, but um, it is one of the only FDA approved automated hair medical devices for hair transplantation. It's the least invasive. As I said, it's almost painless. No stitches, no staples, no scars that are linear and noticeable. Uh, there's no numbness because there's no surgical incision. Recovery time, most people are back to work within five days without concealment. They just style their hair and go. Um, I was back to working out in two weeks. I let people do a brisk walk within a few days, um, but nothing really strenuous till about two weeks and no really strenuous sports till about a month. Um, it says patients can come back to work the next day. Sure you can, especially if you can wear a hat, but people want to know when they have total concealment and they look normal, five days. Um, and oh yeah, and the cost. So it's about half the cost of um, the traditional procedure. So that's pretty awesome. The take rate is about 95 to 98%. I think we're probably on the high end of that, that we've gotten really, really good at this. And the best part for all of you folks who have buried with me for the last 40 minutes, um, we are running a special because we want to promote this procedure to the people who have been invested in watching this Facebook Live and interested enough to, to follow. And as it is, we're kind of on the lower side of the cost nationwide. But I just tell you this sincerely, buyer beware. Buyer beware. Um, if it's significantly cheaper, you are not getting the same quality. And I know this, and I'm not going to name names, but there is a practice out of Northern Virginia that is like half the cost of everybody in Maryland and their results are awful and I have a lot of people come to get their results repaired and sometimes I can't repair it because they've damaged the donor site so um, please do your due diligence I would ask you to look at people's before and afters 
I encourage you to speak with some of my prior patients if you want to talk to people directly about their experiences. Um, I can tell you we've never had one of these fail. They, they've always turned out nice. People ask me what happens if it doesn't work. I don't know. We haven't gotten there. I make it right, but um, I've never had a patient for whom the hair didn't grow and look natural and look nice. Uh, but anyway, what I was saying was, yes, there's a special incentive and my office manager and my office staff, um, they have that and um, they'll get you the details um, if you get in touch with them in the next couple of days. So I would encourage you to, to take advantage of that. Before we finish, does anybody have any questions at all that I didn't answer that I could talk about uh, hair transplantation, hair loss, neografts, PRP, uh, red light, anything, anything I can go over with you at all? All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining me today. As you can tell, I'm passionate about Neograft. Um, I'm a patient myself, a uh, very satisfied customer. So I, I believe in the procedure and we're really passionate about it. And we have a great team. So I, I really hope that you share the word. Please uh, you know, like and share this post. I would like good, solid medical information to be out on the internet. Uh, there's you know, such a paucity of really good information, I think, that people can, can count on and trust uh, firsthand from a physician who does the procedures. So uh, please, you know, help me by getting the word out by liking.